So, I, I mean, I realize there's a little bit of I mean, the theory. You can go deeper and deeper into the theory and never get any sort of exposure to real problems. But um, the, you know, the theory behind this is um, important because you know the, we haven't even touched the, the case when. Um, the convex function is not, you know, smooth, right? I mean, there are cases when you have sharp um, corners, like like in the V-shape, like in the absolute value. And I'm not talking about one dimension, but several dimensions. Um, <clears throat> then, of course, you cannot talk about the gradient at those points, because you don't have a derivative. So KKT is not, um, doesn't make sense. So in a way, you're excluding those points from, from, the, uh, from the possible optimal points, but they are, they are possibly they are optimal points. So that, that would be the analogy of finding critical points by setting the gradient equal to 0 or where gradient doesn't exist. Um, but it's it's more complicated than that. I mean, it's um, so we're not exhausting basically the theory that uh, goes with the convex functions. Um, we'll just stay with the ones that are smooth and convex. Uh, all right, so let's see. The first example is, well, before I go into a specific example, let me just say one more thing. So, so convexity buys you basically automatic uh, optimality for the KKT solutions. Um, there is something that's called strictly convex, which is the case when you have um, strict inequalities rather than you know greater than or equal to so basically those exclude the cases when you have possibly flat or uh, semi positiveness yeah, so zero eigenvalues in certain directions um, and that would basically translate into ba having positive definite uh, hessians um, what's the advantage there is that you can get automatically uniqueness of those minimum points. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see in, a, in the examples if we can actually conclude uniqueness by this sort of positive definiteness of the um, Hessian or not. Um, but let's, uh, let's just start with, um, for instance, the following. Um, find the distance um, from the origin to the um, hyperplane given by AX equals B. Um, but just like before, um, where A is A1, AN, and B is a scalar. So the picture is, is like, like the one before there is in Rn, this is this is an Rn picture, and I have this hyperplane. So it's a one constraint, one linear constraint. Right? And what we'd like to find is, um, <clears throat> of course, assume b is not zero. It means that this x cannot be zero, right? So you don't. You don't have a 
zero distance. You have a positive distance from the origin to this point. How do you find that distance? So, square root of some of the x squares of the of the of the, uh, of the um, x x is a variable, um, and minimizing that subject to this constraint, right? But <clears throat> so exactly. So I mean, the distance, just taking word by word, it would be the square of the of the squares, right? Subject to ax equals b, but you recognize this is not a linear optimization, it's not a convex optimization. Why is it not convex? Or is it convex? I think it's convex. Okay. It is convex, but um, computing the gradient of this is not a pleasant thing. It is much easier. It is a convex uh, optimization. Um, minimizing the square uh, without the square root, the sum of the squares. You know, a one x one plus a n x n equals b. So without. Okay, why is that the case? Well, if wherever the minimum occurs for the distance, it also occurs for the square of the distance. It's still. It's, it's, going to be a it's also going to be a minimum. So, finding the x1, xn. I mean, we'll have the, have the same solution. That's why we say equivalent. It has the same uh, solutions x. Now, just like before, this norm would be the length. And I, I mean, you've probably seen it. If not, you know, this is what the convention is: is the norm or the length of this vector of, of these many components. And the square of the norm would be the sum of the squares of the individual components. OK, so that's, um, so it's actually, you know, that's how it's uh, listed in the book, example 3.22. So whenever you see a norm, that, that's basically what it means, length squared. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so um, clearly we have, well, we don't have any inequality constraints. We have an equality constraint that's a linear equality constraint. And um, f of x equals x squared is convex function. Uh, there are several ways to see this. Of course, one way would be take Hessian. And you would get two zero zero. It would be diagonal, right? Oops, excuse me. Two 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 zero zero. And regardless of where it's computed, and so it's all I can values are equal to 2. So it's positive definite. So it's actually a strictly convex. So again, that's just a bonus kind of. What is, what is this going to uh, buy us is there's going to be one single minimum. In other words, the distance is achieved at only one minimum. 
at, at, at only one point, which makes sense, right, in the picture. Of course, you can say even more. The vector where this is achieved should be orthogonal to the hyperplane. So in the end, whatever vector you get, uh, x it would be orthogonal to the hyperplane. Well, what's the normal to the hyperplane? A, right? So, really, the conclusion is that x is going to be parallel to A. But let's see, why, how do we get there? Well, um, so now we're going to do this. I mean, really, we only do Lagrange multiplier now because we don't have any quality constraints. So we don't have KKT uh, stuff. So we do a uh, gradient of f. So we take h of x to be ax minus b. So the gradient of h is a, right? Take the partial derivatives and you get a. And Lagrange multiplier. method is grain of f plus lambda grain of h equals zero. Now what's the grain of f? 2x, right? Plus lambda times a equals zero. So it means x is, as I said, minus lambda over 2 times a. So a x, the optimal x, is in the direction of a. How do you find what lambda should be? So this means x is parallel to a. x, optimal x, right? To find lambda, we get what? Ax equals b, so that means minus lambda over 2a times a Let's see, can you, I mean, I'm sort of having Some of the some of the gradients should be as as columns. Some should be as rows. Remember, for instance, for the uh, gradients of H, we should have row or column. I think as a and just look at this. Here you have a row. And here you, you, you really have a, well, a row, I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, okay, so the grain of f is, is a row, and so this should be a row, right? Okay, but x, okay, x is, uh, I mean, there is some ambiguity here. X, we like X to be columns, right? So if you'd like, you'd put X tra uh, A transpose here. If A, is a, if A is a row, then you have to put a, a transpose. Um, I mean, the ambiguity dis disappears when you get to this point and you say, well, what does A times A mean? It really means the inner product, right? Or which would be the same as 1A is a row, 1A is a column. So this is <clears throat> length squared, right? So this is a squared. Does it make sense or no? So that's what lambda is. So 
in the end, x star is minus lambda over 2a, so it's going to be, what is it? b a over a squared. So what's the distance then? I mean, it's always nice to remember that you, you really have to minimize something, not just... I've seen that in the homework, where um, you find the optimal uh, solution, but not the optimal value of the, of the problem. So um, x squared um, is, would be what? b squared a squared over a to the fourth, so it's going to be b squared over a squared. Is that what we get? Yeah. Okay. So using this method, you could actually find what? You could find distance from a point to a convex set. Same strategy um, works in finding the distance from the origin to a convex set. Of course, it would be better if the convex set doesn't include the origin. Why is that? Well, a convex set is, you know, characterized by, well, okay, if the convex set is given as a level set of a, of a convex function, then how are you going to get the distance? You're going to minimize x squared subject to g of x negative, right? And then you have to use KKT. Um, the problem that I assigned is actually not uh, it appears like it's not uh, one of those, but let's let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this this one. Uh, It says find the closest point closest point to the origin on the surface x y sorry xz plus yz equals 1. Okay, so if you just set it as a minimization problem, you would be actually minimum of the x squared subject to this equality constraint. What's the problem with the equality constraint? It's not linear, right?
So if it's not linear, as I said, it's um, you may not get a unique solution, right? You may get several solutions. Does this preclude you from actually applying KK, uh, I mean the KKT or the Lagrange multiplier? No, you'll just get several, sev you may get several solutions. So, So the equality constraint is not uh, linear or affi affine, <clears throat> but it is still okay to use KKT or Lagrange multipliers. And again, keep in mind the following. I mean, we cannot really, I mean, I, I don't know how this uh, surface looks like, but the, the, Im the image in 2D would be sort of similar. You have, imagine that now you have some sort of, I mean, I believe it is convex if you allow ine one inequality. So imagine like a, imagine a convex set like this, say even containing the origin, that now you want to find the minimum, right? You can already see that there, there could be more than one point where the minimum is achieved. I mean, if it's if it's symmetric about this. Right? You could have actually two minima. Yeah? And I think that's the, that's the case here. If you... So keep in mind you may find um, more than one solution. And xy plus y, <coughs> xz plus yz, less than or equal than 1 is convex. Okay. How do you verify that? Uh, just look at this function and well, it may or it may not be actually. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Okay. So they're not. It's not convex. So it's not convex in either direction, right? Um, but let's see. So if you solve this and you get several solutions. How can you conclude what's the closest? First of all, is there a closest or is there a maximum point? Is this minimum or a maximum? Minimum because you can, uh, the function goes to infinity, right? As x, y, z goes to infinity, because the sum of the squares. So you will have a minimum. And I guess you just cannot tell if you get multiple solutions, if they're all minimum or one is minimum and, and some others are several points. Okay? Um, 
S same for the surface of equation. Same for x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals 1. Just have to use Lagrange multiplier. You're going to have one, uh, one Lagrange multiplier because you have one constraint. Let's see, I think problem number 11 is, is a problem with the ladder, and um, I think when you set that up, you're going to get a set of inequality constraints that are all convex, and so is the um, uh, objective function. So that's going to be a convex optimization problem. And again, KKT is, is, is what is going to give you the solution. Has anybody set it up first? So let me just kind of um, Problem says you have some sort of an obstacle. I don't know, like a shade or some 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 storage. Thank you. Um, yeah, pictures on the next page. A B, and you'd like to actually uh, put a ladder. You know, to kind of be um, um, leaning on on the wall and on the base here, but of course you cannot go in that in that forbidden region, and <clears throat> you want to do it with a minimum distance, minimum length. So, what is let's call this to be x, and this to be y. Okay, then what you'd like is you'd like to minimize the distance between these two points. So you're going to have x squared plus y squared subject to what, what um, constraint? The distance to the origin is said? I think one way to I don't I don't know. To me one way to, to, to set this would be to say um, at this point, the value of the height of the ladder at this A has to be at least B. 
right? So. Basically, it means at this point, A, if X is here and Y is here, this height has to be at least B. Right? So you just have to measure, you just have to compute this. What's this height compared, given an X and a Y? So geometry, right? So you have x, let's call this height h, right? So it would be what? Um, x over x minus a has to equal y over h. Yeah? So h is y times x over x no y times x minus a over x right and I want this to be at least b Is that right? So it looks non-linear again. So if you if you multiply this out, it would be y x minus y a less greater than going to bx or xb. So a bx plus ya plus ay minus xy less than or equal to zero. Is that what you? No, I did something completely. Yeah, I did. What did you do? It was like similar to triangles. Mm -hmm. And then I said that the slope of this hypotenuse has to equal the slope of this hypotenuse. So the slope of which hypotenuse? Uh, well, you have like two triangles in there. Uh, so I, I wrote like y minus b over a has to equal b over x minus a. OK, which slopes? Uh, so, I mean, you have one line, but you can break it up into two lines, right? Yeah. You have, like, two triangles. You mean this and that? Yeah. Okay. So, do, like, y minus b over a is, like, the slope of, of the top of the line, right? y minus b, b over a, uh-huh. Right, that's 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 the other uh, conditions that needs. But uh, if you multiply this through, y minus b, x minus a, is x y plus minus a y minus b x. It's the same thing, right? Now, you have. <coughs> I think. One thing that you have to be careful is um, why do you uh, set the equality constraint and not an inequality constraint? So assuming these two slopes are the same, it means that the latter has to hit that ob obstacle. 
and I think, I, I mean, yeah, in the end, that's going to be where the optimal is achieved, but I think you should consider, you know, sort of the, gr the bigger feasible region where you have inequality possible. I mean, physically, I mean, it's not, it's not going to give you the optimal solution. So in other words, setting equality constraint and setting inequality constraint are going to give you the same optimal solutions. Or that inequality is going to be binding constraint. Is that not to be that um, unless you make this, this diff, uh, separate argument which says, well, uh, the latter, if it doesn't hit the obstacle, Yeah, you have to you have to prove the optimal solution has this equality. I mean, has this equality constraint. I mean, the, the way the problem is phrased, I think it's that you know it doesn't it it, it allows for for have a larger you know uh, ladder that doesn't touch that thing. But that's that's fine. I think what you'd have to change here is um, that the slope the slope here and the slope here are, you know, possibly, you know, this slope is, is, is more, is, you know, is more, uh, is less than this slope. So you'd have inequalities. No, 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 but what I mean is, yeah, look, <laughs> what I mean is what you compute is like this. The latter is, is a straight line, but what you compute is you compute the slope from that top of the ladder to the top of the right so if the ladder is, is like big enough so it doesn't hit the, it doesn't touch that obstacle then this obstacle you know that that line and this line are you know that slope is smaller because it's negative than this so if you do this then you'd get the same constraint Right? I believe so. No? Okay. What's wrong with this? Oh, yeah. I think, okay. When you put over A, you should have put over minus A. Because the actual slope is Y minus B over zero minus A to be less than. Okay. So, anyway, so you can you can work. I mean, I think you should work with inequality constraint, and conclude that you know that constraint has to be binding. That would be kind of the more general. And of course, there are these other two constraints which said. Um, so that's one, and of course that X. It has to be bigger than A, and Y has to be bigger than B. Okay? And those will not be binding constraints. Okay, so that's that's that. Um, so again, it's not a convex constraint. I think only in problem uh, number, which I only assigned to the grad students, the last problem, that is a okay. That has no constraint actually. Last problem has no constraint, so it's an. Let me see, it's an unconstrained, but it has a convex convex um, functional, and so you just have to compute the gradient set it equal to zero. We see when it's zero. Why are you laughing? Oh, easy. <laughs> yeah. And just to give you sort of a. Well, graduate students should have seen norms, 
but um, in number 14, so given any matrix A, given any vector B, of course, with the correct number of components, um, unless there is a solution for AX equals B, so if there is no solution for that, like if it's incompatible, or I mean it has no no exact solutions, um, then you can still kind of minimize this this uh, this this not distance, but this this function. <clears throat> over all possible vectors, right? It's a convex function, and so how do you sh show it's a convex function? You have to compute the Hessian, right? And um, Just keep in mind what this means. This basically means that it's a x minus b dotted with a x minus b. Or if you'd like to write it in terms of matrix multiplication, so this is a dot product or unit product. Um, in terms of matrix multiplication, is matrix mu matrix multiplication. It would be the A transpose. I mean, it's basically <coughs> this, which was a column. Now you make it a row times a column. Okay. So it's what? It's basically A. Looks like it's X transpose A transpose minus B transpose A X minus B. So when you multiply this through. You're going to get what? I'll let you tell you to do this, but you get four terms, right? The first term is going to be quadratic in X. Agree? X transpose A transpose AX. The other terms will be either linear or with no x. So what happens when you compute the Hessian? You take second derivatives, the terms that are linear and the terms that are have no x psh, just disappear. The only term that it survives is the first term, and of course you have to figure out what that Hessian looks like. And then show that it is non-negative definite, uh, semi-positive definite. Semi-positive definite. Okay. And um, and then how do you actually? I mean, you have to show that this is true in general, right? That is semi-positive definite uh, for any a and any b. Then you know we have a specific example there, a problem that um, a specific metrics. <coughs> how do you find the critical points? You just have to take the first derivative, so the first, the gradient, and set it equal to zero, and solve it. Okay. I guess you'd have to do this in general too, because um, it asks for basically how to solve this in general and then apply it to this example. But again, the fact that it's it's um, convex is important because it gives you. something to hold on to. I mean, you have, it's not like it has 20 um, critical points and you don't know what the nature of those critical points is. All the critical points that you find will be optimal solutions, right? There may be non-unique, you may have several of them, uh, but but you have uh, optimal solutions. Um, yes? It's a matrix. 
square metrics. So other than being a square matrix, we don't know anything else about it. Well, that's, I think that's going to be exactly the, the Hessian. So you have to show that that's semi-positive definite. I mean, if A is M, M times N, M cross N, uh, then A transpose is N cross M. So A, tr A transpose A, N by N. Yeah, depending which way you, m you multiply. Um, it's a square matrix, so, you know. And it's, it's symmetric. You have to show it's symmetric. Why is it symmetric? If you take the transpose of this, it's going to be it's going to be ident same. So it's a symmetric matrix, and um, you know. And then is the question: Is it positive? How, how do you show it's it's a positive definite? No, symmetric means the transpose equals itself. The transpose of the matrix equals the matrix itself. Uh, but, you know, you have symmetric matrices that are not positive definite or non negative definite. Okay. Um, I guess the last, well, I have maybe two more comments, but th this should actually, hopefully, um, get it to, um, to finish this quickly. Um, <clears throat> so two more comments is the example 3.2, it's, it's, it's a, regardless this example 3.21, which really says back to a linear, a linear programming problem, which is to minimize a linear function subject to, let's, let's talk only about standard form, so subject to some equality constraints and x positive, okay? Then you can see what? You can see that this is actually um, can also be thought as, as a convex optimization problem. Because you have, this is a affine, this is a linear, linear constraint, so the feasible set is a convex set. Yeah? And what you're minimizing is a convex function. Well, it's more than a convex, it's a linear function. Yeah? So, Whatever you get through this KKT uh, conditions, will be optimal solutions. Okay, so it has KKT solutions. Um, I'm sorry, has optimal solutions given by the KKT condition. So if you imagine all those, uh, it's basically, you know, say the simplex method or um, what are the optimal solutions of a, of a standard linear programming problem? Some of the vertices for this, for some of the extreme points for that thing, which some are, uh, you know, have non-basic variables to be zero, so it has a guaranteed some zeros, right? And then some basic variables which may may or not may or may not be zero, but um, 
it's it's what the simplex method actually strives to find, right? Find the op optimal solutions. Well, here what is it saying is saying that the KKT system is doing the same thing and is actually finding all solutions. Right? The simplex method was just kind of going and reaching one solution and then sort of declaring victory, but the KKT condition, and let's see how this looks. Um, so it's pretty much, if you think about, it's pretty much um, Lagrange multiplier plus this as being the inequality constraints. Okay, so h of x is a x minus b, and g of x is minus x, right? Because we want this to be less than or equal to zero. So then <clears throat> we have gradient of f plus lambda times the gradient of g plus, I'm sorry, plus mu times the uh, gradient of g plus lambda, gradient of h equals zero, mu g equals zero, mu positive, g negative, right? So what's the grain of g? Well, what's the grain of f? f is linear, so the grain of f is just the, 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 that, the, that, uh, those coefficients of the objective function. Grain of g is minus identity. Because g is just minus x. Again, think of g as columns, because you list those, uh, you know, one constraint after the other as a column, right? Then grain of g is going to be for each component for x1, for instance, is going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, right? So that's why it's identity. It's a square matrix, right? Of course, it's going to get hit by a row of mu's. And what's h? What's grain of h is? Anybody? Again, that's a matrix. I'm sorry, that's a, that's a column. h is a column. You're going to take the partial with respect to each x, each component of x, what's going to be left? A, which is a m times n, right? You know that's kind of the difficulty in this. In this, you know, we use the same sort of. We don't use bold, or we don't use arrow. I mean, arrows to indicate vectors because some of these are matrices. You have to keep track of what the sizes of those things are. And let's basically you're going to end up with C plus. A minus mu plus lambda a equals zero and what else? Um, mu times x equals zero, mu positive and x positive, right? I mean g negative, so x, x g is negative x, right? So you have mu positive, x positive, uh, where mu is strictly positive, x has to be zero, right? But because of this, so this has to do with a little bit of the dual uh, variables, right? So you have not dual, excuse me, the, um, at, a, at an optimal x. At basic variables that are not zero, mu has to be zero, right? Mu corresponds to uh, uh, 
Yeah, it doesn't have to do with the dual, but let's just go one step further and say what is uh, what is then um, how do we solve for for x here? Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and, and of course ax ax equals b. That's that's also important. I forgot to put it here. So h has to be zero. All right, so that's the system. Yes, please. In the book, they've got, just like you do, that the second line, mu x equals zero. Mm -hmm. But they, they say mu is less than zero. Less than zero. So we, because they use plus, they use plus here for... Um, so we, we have a negative mu x equals zero? Yeah, but... We have ours? It doesn't matter. My, minus mu x or... or Equals zero, yeah, yeah. So our mu is minus with their mu. And I don't know, I mean, this would be the sort of the standard. If you just remember KKT, you want to minimize something, so the mu's have to be positive. I mean, you don't have to switch. You can always switch, but. <clears throat> um, all right, so if you look at it a little bit uh, more, you see that mu is C plus lambda A. So this has to be positive, so that's one condition. And um, the other one is AX equals, oh, the other condition is, is mu times X equals zero. So basically you get C times lambda A X equals zero. But this is, remember this is true, basically component by component. So this is mu, if you'd like, is mu I X I. So this is on each component equal to zero. And <clears throat> am I missing something? Of course, AX equals B. So once again, how do you, how do you, I mean, if you have a solution to this, of course, you don't know lambda. But if you have a solution to this system, uh, the system being, yeah, this, this, basically these two, and also, um, these components are positive, right? So if you, if you have a solution to an optimal solution to the linear programming problem, you have an optimal verdict, vertex, right? That basically means that there are lambdas that satisfy this thing, right? Or vice versa. If there are lambdas such that you know you are on that feasible region and uh, all the components of this this sort of column or row, I think it's a row, um, are all positive and they are sort of complementary to whatever x size you have. Then that that is an optimal solution. So it's a sort of a different characterization of the optimal solution for a linear programming problem. And the nice thing about these lambdas is they correspond to, what, what do they correspond to? They correspond to the exact Lagrange multipliers for the constraints that appear and the inequality constraints that appear there. So AX equals B. Now, this really kind of, and I, I, I I, don't, I want to stop here, but this this really has to do with the um, gives you another another explanation why when you start with a with a linear programming problem with inequality constraints, so in a not in a standard form but sort of canonical form. Is it raining? It's going to rain. Um, so imagine imagine you're. Yeah. Okay. One minute. If you have a simplex, if you have a simplex that you look at, right, and you have an optimal vertex in that simplex, right? Well, some of the constraints will be binding and some not, right? Because that vertex is going to be where some of the constraints are equal equality, and some are not, right? Well, that basically says for the ones that are that this is equality constraint. You can talk about the Lagrange multipliers, right? 
the shadow prices. Those will be exactly these lambdas. The other ones will be zero because the other lambdas will be zero because there are, those are non-binding constraints. Right? So that's just sort of a different way to look at that relationship between the Lagrange multipliers being shadow prices for the, for the constraints that are binding. Okay? Um, and I'm stopping here. It's 1.30 along, according to my clock here. So, thank you. And of course, next week we'll kind of make another uh, jump from, you know, being sort of uh, classes of, of linear programming, a, a programming problem that can be solved by these methods, either Lagrange multiplier or KKT, to you know problems that you really need a computer to approximate solutions. And I will have uh, sort of a sample exam uh, posted over the weekend. So, and I'll email you uh, when I when I do that. So if you if you have time to look at it, if not, we'll talk about Monday. Question. This is an important